you know, I do a lot of thinking about, uh, about what, what we do in our profession and different ways to think about it. And so to me, it's not so much of, you know, I'm not the guy that's going to go and give you all the technical information in every corner of the, of the program and every single like trick that no one else knows. I kind of feel I'm a little bit of a, you know, if you're, if you're talking about boxing metaphors, I'm throwing jabs, crosses, and hooks. I'm just throwing like the, ba- I mean, I have the basics and I have um, a little bit of a creativity of using those, those basics in a way that I feel defines my, my style and my, um, my vision. So I like talking about, and I, so I feel the reason why that is relevant is because that's exactly what I think beginners and, and younger artists need. They need to understand that that those basics, those things that you already know, that is all you need to know. And what's preventing you from achieving those higher levels of what you're trying to, um, what you're trying to reach, that's not, it's not a matter of like learning a new software. It's not what's going to get you to be that great artist that you think that you should be. Um, it's not, it's a matter of your thinking and th- your creativity using those basics in a way that is that is your true vision that you have in your head. I'm delighted to welcome to the Learn Squared podcast, our instructor, Aaron Lamonic. Aaron is a legend within the industry, who is best known for being a lead concept artist at Naughty Dog, working on the iconic Last of Us and Uncharted series. Our Sketching Anything instructor is also fronting our first ever live workshop session, which begins on October the 9th. Aaron's stunning work speaks for itself. And in this episode, we get an insight into what makes his creative mind tick. From an unwavering drive to excel, to nurturing a genuine passion to help students improve and grow, I hope you walk away from this episode as inspired as I was. Let's go. Um, hey everyone, welcome back to the Learn Squared podcast and have an awesome guest today, Aaron Lamonic. Hey Aaron. Hey, how's it going? Good, thank you. Um, thank you for joining me. I'm looking forward to speaking with you today um, and a few reasons why, obviously. Um, you're an awesome artist, one of our instructors and you're also back at Learn Square headquarters doing something awesome with us um, with, with our first ever live session. Yeah, I I have a long standing relationship with Learn Squared, and I love what you guys do. I always I remember back when Mache and and Ash when they originally kind of started it, and and I just I love the the format and the platform in general. So I just I always every time Mache hits me up, I always want to get involved because it's just a great it's a great way to reach a lot of people and and kind of just provide a lot of a lot of information for us art artists in the art community. You know, definitely. And I think like, just to touch up on quickly on your course that you have with us, um, sketching anything, like seeing what students make from that course, even still today. Um, it, it's, I think in my opinion, it's one of our most empowering courses for even like students of all levels, just either refining their current skill set or learning something new that they can, you know, like thrive from their, their own voice. Um, like, What's your bit? What's been your reaction or your take on what students have been doing since learning from you? Well, you know, it's like I kind of always, I always start every every class I do, or every workshop I do, or every every educational thing I've done for the last, you know, whatever ten years that I've been doing educational stuff. It always kind of starts from the same place, which is I want to take something that's really complex and I want to break it down so people can see behind the curtain and see how we think about this sort of stuff. And so I think what I get, what I enjoy seeing from students and people who learn from, from any of my courses is how they can start to formulate not only their own, um, not only their own unique style and way of thinking, but a way to kind of problem solve and dig through these really more daunting tasks or more daunting assignments or, or, more intimidating subject matter and do it in a way that seems like, oh, you know, they're really, I can see them working through it and mm-hmm. figuring out stuff that you could see maybe a year prior or, you know, a couple of years prior, they would have not even been willing to attempt it. And then you see the confidence growing. Yeah. And then obviously, you know, some of us, I, myself included, you get overconfident, you try something a little too <laughs> crazy and then you got to, you got to wind it back a little bit. But I think that's a healthy, a healthy uh, 
process, the thinking process for everybody. And I love seeing, I love seeing them go through that because it reminds me of being a student, which is such a, a fond uh, experience for me. And of your own journey. So like, is that something that you like tackled head on yourself when you saw like something complex and obviously decoded it to the point where you can understand it and then build it to however you want to, to make your creations? Um, is that something that came natural to you? Is that something that you had either battled with or struggled with in the past? I mean, I've, I always have struggled with it and I still do. I mean, it's really the kind of thing where I everyone has their own specific inclinations, you know, and one of my inclinations as a student was always like, you know, having really big aspirations of what I wanted to do. And I have this, this like theory that I always talk about in my talks, which is like, you're five years better in your head which is just like, a, it's just a, a simple way of saying what I always felt as a, as a young kid, you know, starting to learn how to be an artist or where I wanted to go with it, which is that you always understand stuff uh, intellectually a lot faster than you're able to actually do it, which is one of the most frustrating things about being an artist. And I would imagine people that are professional musicians at a high level and, and even athletes, like they experience the same thing because mm playing sports and doing any of that stuff you 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 it's not like you don't understand what is the right thing to do when you see it you see it and you understand it mentally but then when it comes time to all right now do it some there's a, this weird disconnect in your brain that makes you not quite able to achieve what you picture in your head and us being an artist i would see like i guess you could say like a, a blurry image of what i kind of want to do or a foggy idea of what i want to do in my head never quite being able to do that until obviously five years is an arbitrary deadline. But mm -hmm. in my experience, like after several years go by, you're like, oh, you know what? I can finally do that thing that I had in that stupid dream that I wanted to like try and make an art piece of, or I wanted to illustrate just one piece of it or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And years go by and then you can finally do it. And then now you have new aspirations that you can't do yet. And mm -hmm. that's kind of, to me, that's one of my, that's just one of my characteristics. And so I always... Wow. I guess you could say I, I spread myself thin in that regard, but that's, yeah, to answer your question, yeah, for sure. And I think that's like something that I've concluded as well, is that that kind of trait or I guess that pattern of behavior, like you mentioned, where something that you're trying to accomplish, you have grasped and then all of a sudden something new comes up. I guess that is a sign that you're on the right path as at least a creative, right? And um, at least trying to push and improve your skill set, no? Yeah, for sure. And I think that it's a very healthy way of, again, totally subjective in my personal opinion, but I think it's a healthy way to stay inspired and to stay fresh and to always be challenging yourself where I know that there's this stigma in the art world or where the way you see artists portrayed in movies, like they always hate everything they do and they're depressed and, you know, whatever. And I think there's a, some truth to always being, you know, maybe and I, I maybe it stems from that concept that i'm discussing of being kind of always being able to see further into your own future in terms mm -hmm. of what you will be able to do but not quite be able to achieve it yet uh, whether it be from technical skills or from your just overall organization of your thought process or whatever it is something mm -hmm. there's a disconnect and so yeah that's i think um i think that's a very good it's absolutely a good sign and it there's another thing that I, uh, that if I can digress slightly, there's sure. another thing that I think is kind of related to that in a way, which is that you kind of, you always, you always look at what you're doing in a certain, in a certain light and you, you have to be, you have to be realistic about what you can expect from yourself and what you, based on the work that you've done try to put things into perspective by looking backwards in time just a little bit. So there's this weird, there's this weird phenomenon that I always ask students if they experience it. And a lot of people do, which is that you feel like you're getting worse as time goes on. You're like, I don't understand. I felt like I was good coming into this class. Why am I drowning? Why do I feel like I just can't do anything good anymore? And that the way I describe that is that is because your brain is adapting to going into new territory that you're not comfortable with anymore. And then every time you stretch the muscles, so, so to speak, you, you stretch into a new area and you feel like you're getting worse. And that actual is it the, the actual the reality of what's happening is you're getting way better. And yeah. so but but it hurts to get better because you're stretching the boundaries of what you're able to understand. So when you go back in time. Look at those sketchbooks, look at those pieces that you haven't looked at in like a year or six months or however long ago, you might find some redeemable qualities, but you'll look at it and say, oh, okay, 
that person couldn't do the thing I'm doing right now. That's for sure. That's you know what a, I mean? Yeah, that definitely. That's a very good point as well. Um, and that's that's things that I've experienced that a few times as well, where like you hit the nail on the head. Um, I'm just essentially repeating what you just said, where you think, oh, things are not progressing. I've actually taken a step back. But then you look at like a past project, either something recent or even in the past and realize, oh no, that there has been improvement because either I can see the flaws in that particular piece versus what I'm working on currently. Um, or even not, you just see already that, okay, if I were to do this now, I would obviously change it um, completely and do a different approach. Um, you mentioned like as a metaphor, like when you're learning something new, um, like it's equivalent to like either, you know, drowning or like jumping straight into the deep end. Um, when was the last time you experienced that as a creative? I mean, I do it all the time. I find, mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, I wish I could say I'm, I'm just, you know, batting a thousand every day, but yeah. I just don't, it, it's not quite, it's, it's, if, if you feel like you're always perfect, then something I would say, in my opinion, I feel like something's probably not right. You mm -hmm. should feel like there's challenges on a daily basis and you're, you're trying something not, nuts, not to say like. Some days you just happen to do things perfectly and everything seems to go your way. And that mm -hmm. happens too. And I, and man, I, I love that feeling that when, when mm -hmm. everything just lines up perfectly and everything you thought it was going to be, it works out that way. But I think the, the real growth happens when you are not feeling that way, because mm -hmm. it's just that same concept of like, it's not really, um, practice makes perfect necessarily, but it's how can you react to the adversity or the the whatever went wrong and whatever you didn't like how can you not make that mistake again and that's mm -hmm. like the that's that's 10 times as valuable as looking at your work and being like man i really did well on that one or yes. that really worked out great because yeah. you're not learning anything you're going to keep doing the same thing again which is great but you can learn a lot more when you're like oh you know what that's that thing that i do sometimes and that mm -hmm. really bothers me thought being thoughtful about it is gonna make you leapfrog a lot faster and how have you yourself nurtured those, I guess like you could say tools and methods to help yourself like look at yourself subjectively and objectively um, and also critically just to ensure that you are improving because obviously you mentioned before like art is something that's personal, people get attached to it and you know like when you, things are not or you perceive that they're not going well, it can either put you on a downer and make you kind of like not enjoy the thing you're supposed to be enjoying. Um, but obviously, if you take a step back and observe yourself as like, you know, um, a teacher to a student, but to yourself, then you can kind of see the things that you can improve on um, and things that you can obviously work on. Um, like, do you employ any specific kind of like traits or tips and tricks um, or is it something that you just kind of like naturally um, kind of understood over time? Um, I, I really don't have a, a great answer for that. All I know is that there's a difference between mindlessly just re doing repetitions of something mm -hmm. and that, you know, and between that and really digging deep into the thing that you think is your weakness or something that you think is, it doesn't go as smoothly for whatever reason. Um, and I, I think how do, how, how I keep myself, uh, always learning is just always looking for whatever's the weakness and comparing mm -hmm. My, my work to other work that I see or my colleagues, I'm, I'm really fortunate to work with, you know, work alongside people who are always just really pushing the envelope mm -hmm. in terms of technical skill and um, overall like high level quality. So to me, it, it's really easy to see weaknesses in myself because I'm always comparing mm -hmm. it to other people who are really good. So I look for that and I just try to deep dive into like, what is it that they're doing that, that is making it that way? Um, what, what is it that thing that I'm chasing after that I can't seem to quite accomplish in my images that those images are are doing or designs, you know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And sometimes by looking deeper into it, you it, it's a combination of things. It might be a technical thing. It might be a creative thing. And it might actually not be anything. It might just be like, oh, like they do the same thing I do sometimes. And it's yeah. not as depressing as I thought it was. And it's just like sometimes we're all human. P people have mm -hmm. good days and they have bad days. And you're comparing your bad day to someone else's good day and it can make you feel yeah. not you know what i mean it's it yeah, could definitely. be just that simple and like so concept art um your workshop that is starting on the 9th of october um is a live concept art workshop and our first ever workshop that we are hosting um how did you get into concept art like when did that become something that you wanted to pursue 
Oh man. I mean, the, the, the interesting, I love that conversation because that's the people that are my like peers that are my age that were going through school at the time that I was, that we were kind of like what I call like the guinea pig generation <laughs> of entertainment design in school. Like there was no such thing. I know it's hard to imagine now because it's become such a great industry and there's so much content out there and there's so much information. Back then it was, you, you wouldn't even, you didn't even know exactly what places you could work, let alone mm -hmm. where you would want to work or where you'd fit, fit in. There was nothing. There was no social media when I was in college and there was no, there was nothing. It was like people you heard about people who graduated and now they're working in movies and they met someone who's an art director at a party or at whatever, who knows what happened, but it was all word of mouth and just by happenstance. And, um, my story is really not any more, uh, regular than that. It's pretty strange. I, I did a lot of, um, I did a lot of graffiti art um, for mm -hmm. a lot of years in in LA and surrounding areas with a lot of um, really influential street artists. And one w one such street artist um, who is very well known, he goes by Crayola. Who's a Greg Simpkins, who's an amazing um, he's an amazing fine artist. He's not in the entertainment industry, but little known fact that he actually was back then. And he, he had worked at a, a studio that, you know, right as I was graduating school, this is one of those things that just worked out the way it was. I would, first of all, just to take a step back, I would have been down to do anything. I was <laughs> so hungry to get a job and to work and to be successful. It's, it's really hard being an artist and, you know, having people not really maybe doubt if that like, yeah, you're good, but that's not a career, right? That's nonsense. <laughs> like nobody does that. Obviously that just, those opinions come from uh, from ignorance, not from a reality. And it can get people in a very bad mental place myself mm -hmm. as well. But point being is when I came out of school, I, there was nobody more competitive than me and more hungry to mm -hmm. do, to just be an artist and just work and just prove not to prove people wrong, but to prove myself right really. Mm -hmm. And just say, you know what, I can do this. And so Greg, uh, he, he worked at a studio, a sister studio of the one that I ended up working for, which was never soft entertainment, which was, um, uh, one of Activision's studios that at the time they made the Tony Hawk games and they, they made a, 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 a original IP called gun, which was like a Western sort of open world game. Anyway, um, it happened to work out great because I had been, you know, Tony Hawk, a, a lot of th those games in that studio, they were very, um, I guess you could say avant-garde in the, in the game world. They were like mm -hmm. the, the punks, the rock star <laughs> dudes. They were the, the skateboarders and the, the, the whole air of the studio was very much something that, that I kind of grew up in that subculture and graffiti and street art and skateboarding and hip hop and what, and all those different that all those things kind of swim together in a certain way. And I guess I, you know, I was a good fit. I did a, an art test for them, stayed up all night for a couple nights and did, you know, put everything to the side and put everything into it. And they liked uh, what I did and gave me an opportunity. Um, oddly enough, I was a character designer, uh, mm -hmm. was not doing environments. I was doing costume designs and character designs and marker sketches and, and all that stuff. And that, and I didn't, I was just going with the flow. I didn't have an agenda for myself or even, like I said before, I didn't even know, uh, before this encounter, I didn't even know what everyone knows the Tony Hawk, like, uh, franchise, but I didn't know about the studios and studio mm -hmm. life and what it was like. Right. So here I am, I'm finishing school. I'm still in school. And I was so fortunate and so grateful to be able to work part-time for them as a freelancer like at nights on the weekends, um, when my class load was allowing it. And then they brought me in for one day a week in to come into the studio, meet the team and just get to know the process. And so mm. when I, so when I graduated, I had like no weight on my shoulders because I knew that, that, that I would be able to work with them at least on a part-time capacity. Mm -hmm. Um, and luckily they ended up giving me a full-time, uh, contract, which is what I was looking for at that time. And that's, that's how it all started. It's pretty bizarre <laughs> from paint, painting graffiti at Venice beach. You end up working in the entertainment industry. I don't really, that's a very LA story. I would imagine. <laughs> I mean, it's a great story as well. Um, but it's also, I guess it's all a testament to, I guess, just art in the creative field itself is like, it can quickly change. Um, but you know, like, I guess a lot of the stuff that you were doing is, I guess, was it the similar stuff like compared to graffiti and obviously working in games? obviously different mediums, um, but was a lot of your approach to how you create the same during those times? No, I mean, well, 
Mm, yeah, yeah, I guess yes and no, because mm. my I was starting to when I, all the graffiti I was doing was starting to look like my paintings in school because I was learning. It was like it was a perfect uh, time to be, you know, doing that because I was doing tons of traditional paintings. By the way, there was like almost no digital education of digital classes. Mm. Nobody used 3D back then. This is 2004. Mm-hmm. If I can date myself a little bit. That's when I started working in the entertainment industry. Um, and I was doing a lot of acrylic paintings, a lot of oil paintings, and the techniques kind of started to bleed into the kind of the way I was painting <clears throat> with, uh, with aerosol. Mm. So I was, uh, I was starting, it was definitely inspiring. My, my graffiti was inspiring my illustration and mm. my illustration was inspiring my graffiti for sure. But when it came to concept art, I tended to be more, um, traditional more mm-hmm. uh, i don't i mean traditional and yeah i was drawing with markers some of the mm-hmm. time but also just traditional in terms of like what you'd expect to see from concept art clear designs um lots of ideas quick rapid sketches and just trying to feel out like what the characters could feel like and you know again being real world characters what you're really doing is costume design and mm-hmm. that's kind of what it was but it was all stuff that there's a punk rock dude there's a uh, a goth girl there's a you know a hip-hop character there's a graffiti mm-hmm. character there's a it's all you know urban stuff and that was that game was very um the the first one that i worked on was um what was it called was it underground 2 there was underground 2 and then there was american wasteland mm-hmm. anyways they were kind of back to back and it was right around that time but they were very much like trying to pull on that the the fashion that was cool at that time and all the splattery ink ink splatter graffiti look so it was perfect it really it worked out um to to play a lot of my strengths and at that point in time obviously you just jumped into the entertainment industry what was you starting to think about your career from that point like were you starting to think further ahead or did you have other goals in mind at the time i mean i was so young i i didn't really i just got to take a couple years of taking a breath of fresh air and just saying like wow you made it through school which art mm-hmm. center was just the absolute gauntlet back then it was mm-hmm. so brutal and so difficult and made it through that and then ended up getting a job and it all worked out you know like my parents i, I have to give a lot of a lot of um credit to them because they really believed in being a mature adults which i was not <laughs> they could see the reality which is if you really put in the time to something these jobs are out there obviously movies get made somehow people make mm. them right so there are people with those jobs so it's really just giving yourself the skill set so that you can do those jobs if the opportunity presents itself then the only thing standing your way is finding the opportunity rather than oh you need an opportunity but also you're not that good as well so it's kind of like you know that's a much longer distance between two points so my parents believed in in me in that way and um and i just had to after thankfully it gave me uh it gave me a little bit of confidence that like, oh, this isn't such a cold world the way a lot of instructors are pitching it, which Mm -hmm. we can get on on that topic and another another point because that is another thing I should talk about. But being fed this narrative that, oh, there's no work out there. Nobody's working. Oh, it's so brutal, blah, blah, blah. Like just being a negative Nancy about everything. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what you're fed a lot as as a student. And so I didn't really have the confidence that maybe my parents had that there was going to be anything there was going to be anything at the end of the at the end of the journey and so after that period you know a couple of years of just literally just like saying thank you thank you thank you for mm-hmm. being able to find the opportunity in the universe of whoever gave me that opportunity and why that happened to me i was just very grateful and i still am to be honest on a daily basis i do mm-hmm. think about that almost every day like just to be really grateful but there's nothing like being you know a 21 22 year old kid mm-hmm. and just being like man i made it I made it somewhere I, and I didn't care. Like I said, I didn't care. I'm not, I'm not, uh, uppity or, or snobby about where I worked. I was, right. I just wanted to be an artist and that's it. And that, during that time, obviously you said a lot of your stuff was traditional. How, how was your transition to digital? That was, uh, very weird because it really truly was mostly figured out on my own. And I, and I didn't even really figure that out until I was already working as a professional. Mm. School had, you had your generic Photoshop class and whatever, which is probably like equivalent to what you could find at a community college now. Like okay. it's just like, okay, here's how to use Photoshop. All right. You can learn that in a couple of days. Well, yeah. not, not to be too mean about it, but it's like the things you actually need to know, not like 
weird things that you wouldn't like digging deep into the program, like the things that we use on a daily basis to create concept art mm. is not even close to the amount of stuff that Photoshop can do. So a lot of that's useless that you learn in those classes. Yeah. Um, and th so the stuff that was practical, like back then, 2005 things that we use, we, you know, learning how to use blending modes, learning how to photo bash, learning how to adjust photos so that they integrate well into your image. Like there was no book on this. Like there was no, it was literally just trial and error and watching mm -hmm. someone working next to you who started before you and, and seeing like, how did you do that? How do you make that? So I can't tell what is what and how you blend them together and the basic things that we take for granted nowadays. But that was pretty much, it was just trial and error. Mm. It was no, there was no tutorial. There was no nothing. And like, ha so with you learning digital art, I guess like digital tools, obviously through trial and error, is that something that you kind of like, were you addicted to it? Like this new medium, this new realm, or was it something that you were just like, I need to learn this. I need to figure it out how, um, but at the same time, it was kind of, you know, like for some, it can be a bit annoying as well. Like where do you stand on that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it had its annoyances, but honestly, the, the overall benefits were, were huge. I mean, when you realize like what you can do and I, I had, I was very inspired by it, to be honest. I mm. never turned away from my traditional stuff. I always, um, I always stuck to that and, and I still, you know, I'll go on my spurts, you know, I, on Instagram, I've posted a lot of my watercolor ink drawings yeah. and stuff. I went on this like small run for, I guess not small, it was like two or three years of doing a lot of that stuff and re kind of reinvigorating my love for traditional medium mm -hmm. again. But the the digital stuff, I've always embraced it. I always felt like, you know, you could look at it like what people thought of, of uh, you know, I don't know, I guess in the 80s when they like people started doing airbrush art and yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. they wanted to see. Like the people who refused to do it, they weren't working anymore. They're like, that's cool what you were doing in the 60s or the 50s, but we need, we want this new slick look, which is a Tyrannosaurus Rex with orange stripes on it back, on its back, on a skateboard, on top of a chrome dolphin <laughs> and flying in an outer space, you know, 90s, 80s stuff. Yeah. And if you couldn't do it, guess what? You're done. So mm -hmm. to me, it was like, look, you're learning this anyway. You're, this is, you're going to do this because this is obviously the future and you might have some fun doing it because you can do all these cool things with it that would take you forever if you were trying to paint it traditionally so just mm. embrace it have fun with it and, and learn as much as you can pretty much and obviously like since then so many tools have come and gone um but nevertheless the biggest thing has been 3d like that has definitely you know parked itself and made itself something that is i guess you know obviously depending on your skill and what you're trying to execute but it's almost essential in the concept art industry um, but how is your switch to 3D? Because that's obviously a key part of your workflow nowadays, isn't it? It is. It's very much. Uh, it's very much a key part of it, and I think that it it um it definitely has its own learning curve that is different. And I think as time goes on, things get more complex, but simultaneously they get easier mm. to learn. Like the programmers want it to be easy. Like if you compare. For example, if you compare ZBrush in 2005 to, you know, a sculpting program like 3D Coat or something today, the diff or even ZBrush today, if you want to go mm -hmm. one to one, like what those people had to go through in order to learn that alien language that it was and versus nowadays, the, the, the tools that the way that they've been catered to be more artist friendly, more intuitive. Mm -hmm. And, and then you, you go from that to something like 3D Coat, where it's as much like a 3D Photoshop as you could possibly make it. It's like the simplest, easiest thing to pick up compared to, yeah, those, those old things. I think, that, um, I think that the learning curve for 3D, and I think one of, my, you know, one of my advantages is the fact that, you know, what I mentioned before, like coming out of school and immediately having to change the way I worked because we like we were the end of the traditional illustrator generation where yeah. people were doing markers and all that you know like that classic 90s stuff that we all loved and I grew up on as soon as we graduated it was like it it was increasingly becoming more digital so that's why we were learning it on the job not a negative thing but we were learning it very quickly because mm -hmm. it was becoming that so the process of having to change the way you work so so immediately right after coming out of school 
to me gave me a very familiar experience of learning like not to be afraid you know i mean there's a reasonable fear of learning something difficult but mm -hmm. i think not to be intimidated by like understanding try, taking a step to improve your skill set and learn something new for mm -hmm. a lot of people again like i said before if you resisted that if you refused to learn it you better be john park and you better be one of the best digital painters <laughs> on the planet because other than that if you're not willing to not John, Bar by the way, he knows 3D as well. But if, if you if you refuse to learn 3D, you're putting yourself at an immediate disadvantage. Mm. There's no reason why you would want to learn less skills. Like you want to have more skills, mm. right? I will say that with one caveat that is don't get obsessed with it to the point where that's all you care about is learning in the next cool program just to mm. learn it. Like it has to be worth the effort. It has to be worthwhile. Like what are you doing that you couldn't do yesterday? That's the way I look at it. So there was a lot that I couldn't do before or that I did have to do without 3D, but I now have the benefit of being able to model something out if I don't want to paint it. It's a yeah. if, it's not yes. that I have to, it's that I can do it both ways and whichever way makes the most sense, that's what I will do. And that's a good point actually, because it just highlights the fact that you still recognize it as a tool and not like, you know, the be and end all, almost like the magic thing that's going to make your thing for you. Um, and you know, like I think the same question has always been asked, but it's kind of changed a little bit. Whereas previously it was, you know, like you know the the common one, what brushes do you use? To it's kind of changed to like what software do you use? Um, because there's so many options out there now that kind of do the same thing. It's just, I guess, a matter of trying something out and just kind of like having it stick with you, right? Um, but then. You know, like, do you or have you ever gotten lost in trying to figure out all these different tools that are available? Or do you have like a set um, go to little, you know, box of tools that you you never um, tend to veer from unless you are planning on adding something new? Um, it's a combination. So I've definitely tried a bunch of different stuff, but I know pretty quickly if something is maybe going to be too much. So, for example, I know how to use substance painter to texture things however most of the times when i have chosen to use it obviously the result is absolutely incredible but mm -hmm. after looking back at it sometimes i think uh, was it really worth all that extra work or could i have just done it this other way this simpler mm -hmm. way when i when i so i tr i'm always like revisiting um what is the best way to do it and some sometimes the best way is using no 3d at all and sometimes the best way is using all 3D. And it just depends on the image. And I always try to look at a new software as like, a, what will this give me that I couldn't do before? Um, and there are some softwares that absolutely can provide that. Mm -hmm. And then there's other ones where it's just, oh, it's just another thing that you, and, and there's, by the way, there's nothing wrong with people wanting to learn stuff if they're really good at learning software, picking them up quickly and doing a new thing that's fun for, for them. And they do a new piece or two or five, mm. and then they kind of put it away. I'm not knocking that. Like if you, I'm not as good at that as some people, some of my coworkers are genius with like picking it up, understanding it, putting in the time late at night, whatever, practicing, learning all the pitfalls and all the, all the learning curve of all the different little troubleshooting that you have to mm. do on a new software as always. And they just fire something out and it looks sick and it's great. And then maybe they use it again and maybe they don't. I personally don't want to go through the pain of doing mm -hmm. all that unless it's going to be really meaningful for me. And, you know, obviously you're very experienced in the industry. Um, have you ever, as you work for a multitude of clients, freelance and obviously um, in studios as well, have you ever been asked by clients or even on projects? Like has a certain project kind of dictated the tools that you need or has it always been about yourself as in like how you want to create it mm, you know they've never i've never had that i have heard of people asking you know studios were like uh, we need you guys to learn unreal to block to, to basically take our assets and 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 make your scenes in unreal which mm. I, if they did then i would be down but we don't ha we haven't uh i have never experienced that personally mm. it's more just like what tools do you need to learn to most effectively do what they want you to do um and so yeah, there, there's several different things that I think are um, that are in there that are more my choice. It's not like it's been imposed on me. It's more just like, huh, you know, this really does favor this. And if I could learn that one thing, then it would make this part of the process that's generally 
kind of a pain in the ass. It would make it actually really smooth and easy. So then there's a good argument for where you should invest that time, you know. And what is kind of like exciting you going forward? Now, is there something on the horizon that you want to learn? Maybe it's a software or like kind of, um, you know, like a realm in the technological space um, that you might want to experiment more in. Is there something that's on your shortlist right now? I mean, yeah, my shortlist is Blender and Blender right now. Like there, <laughs> that program is so dense and so epic and and it's just changed the game. Like I, I just can't, they deserve an award. They deserve all the awards for yeah. what they did and that it's free and it's, and it's, there's a billion tutorials out there all yeah. and it has a huge community. Like I can't say enough good about it. I'm not, uh, I've, I've been modeling a lot in Blender, so I've been enjoying just that interface and mm-hmm. that process. I'm not great at rendering yet, but I've been rendering in Octane, so I haven't mm. gotten to be where it's only Blender that I'm using. But I mean, in the future, I'm definitely going to go deeper into it. And when I have some more time to kind of experiment and do some personal work that's only and all Blender and the most yeah. efficient workflows and all that. But it's just like a bottomless pit of endless, endless things that you can do with it. It's just good at everything. Yeah, it's very... It's become very powerful. I'd say it's at least in the concept art realm, it's either become or slowly becoming the the go to, at least the industry standard tool now. Um I can't see what else would be. I don't yeah. see anything else that could possibly compete, to be honest. Because usually, or at least like say five years ago, you need something that if you wanted to use a 3D workflow, that is, something that can handle immersion. Obviously, typically you would never use the built in renderer. You'd either buy like something like Octane or whatever else is available. And that would cost an arm and a leg for some as well, especially many years ago. Some of that stuff was quite pricey. To have that now that is free and also can either compete or be better than a lot of the paid stuff out there, that is, that's quite phenomenal. I guess like when you look back at it, um, that is quite an achievement because I remember when I was graduating uni, um, like what Blender was back then was almost laughed at and scoffed at. And now it's like... <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's like, hey, I'm gonna leave the stuff that I was taught and learned, and I'm jumping on Blender. It's true. It really was a silly. Um, it was. It was nothing. Nothing that you'd want to learn. That's for sure. It was not. Um, it was not on the level of anything else at that time. And the interface was really kind of nasty looking. Yeah. I think my my theory is I think that they did what Moto should have done. I think that they took a cue for what Moto was supposed to be and what Moto mm-hmm. was for a long time. That was kind of the concept already software because it it's definitely simpler and less convoluted than something like Maya or mm-hmm. 3DS Max. Those are those are powerful programs that are amazing for either people who already know them or for 3D modelers that use a lot of that stuff. But a little bit more streamlined, a little bit more user friendly. You've got, you know, the 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 preview render, the real time preview render built in and all this kind of stuff. They just didn't um they just didn't keep up with the with the times like what Blender did. I think it has to do with it being an open source thing that people were able to develop tools for and constantly build on. I think it just comes down to that. They just um I think Blender has just taken taken it over. And the now the interface looks good. It's not yeah. messy. It's very easy to understand. If you came from something like Moto, which I used for, you know, a good good run, you know, mm-hmm. almost 10 years or however long it was going to blender i would say there's a just a couple little quirks that are like huh i wonder why they did that but yeah. there's always a plugin that fixes it hmm. so yeah yeah it's, i think it definitely is the open source element to it because i don't think any um like studio that or software developer that actually makes software has had that kind of level of input from a community or many people like you know either indirectly or directly testing what they've built and then people um, directly and indirectly contributing to either fixes or workarounds. And then at the same time, when you have, you know, you can kind of like pick up on what people want and what people don't want. And then it can obviously be amended and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, I, I'm with you on that one. It's like, um, I used Maya before and I've, I think this year, I don't think I've touched that at all. I think I've, at least in commercial projects and even a lot of personal ones, it has been Blender at least this year, which I was surprised at. Um, but nevertheless, there are certain things where I think, okay, why is it doing this? But nevertheless, the 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 pros are definitely outweighing it. Um, so you mentioned earlier a bit about um the the industry. Um, and I believe it was regarding uh, was it to do with tools? Um, or 
um, what you would, no, that's it, teachers and saying that the industry's, you know, like not very positive or you're not going to get your break in there. Um, oh, do you want oh to expand God. on that a bit more? Yeah. So just to clear, <clears throat> just to clear that up, um, I would be very cautious to hear a teacher or a, a mentor or a person give a one-sided answer or one-sided uh, look at something like the industry. Like, mm. so you, what, something that would be very typical, and I don't know in the bigger schools, I don't know if this is still going on. I really hope it isn't, but something tells me that, that negative people will always just spew negativity mm. and ignorance, by the way. But something that would happen a lot is you'd hear a person, they'd be an old illustrator who worked in the heyday of whatever it was that they did. And then they'll come out and they'll, t they'll give you this, like, you know, they'll take away any, you, you get a bunch of kids that are bright and starry eyed, right? And they're fresh, they're ready to go. They're ready to learn. They're excited about what they're doing. They, they have no uh, jadedness or negativity towards this. They're just hopeful and happy and trying to get good and be competitive. And then you get this salty older individual that is not happy with their personal, not the entire industry, because they don't know the entire industry because nobody has worked in the entire industry. You've worked in your one little corner of it, and they would basically just poison the well with their personal experience, which is unfortunate, um, that, but that's not everyone's experience. And you cannot tell that stuff to young people that are aspiring to grow and, and start their life. They're not finishing their career. They're starting their career. Mm. You can't tell them unrealistic um, uh, or unfair judgments of what their experience will be because you don't know what their experience will be. And so I just feel that it's a little bit irresponsible to spread your personal experience as anything but your personal experience. You mm -hmm. could say something like, huh, I had this really, really tough time on this one movie that I worked on and, and they, they treated me this way or this and that. And that, that's one thing to look out for. Maybe spin it in something positive. Like, you got to protect yourselves. Here's what you do to fix that. Or here's how you handle that situation. Here, if that happens to you guys, here's how you respond to that and, and handle it in a, in a correct, mature way, professional way. Um, that would be the correct way to, to do that. But instead, I think what is important is to be as objective as you can, is to not lie to them and not tell them everything is going to be roses and daisies when they mm. come out of school. But just understand, like, you get out what you put in. If you are ultra competitive, positive attitude, easy to work with, you like to talk to people, you like to work with people, um, no matter what, you're, you're, you will obviously stand up for yourself when, when, you know, when the time comes, but at the same time, you're a team player, you want to work with everybody and, and do a, a, an amazing product and you care so deeply about your skill set and about what you've dedicated your life to, what could possibly, the work is out there. Don't mm. lie and say that it isn't because it is because go on Netflix and look at how many icons, how many movies and shows go on Amazon, go on Disney plus go on, you know, go look at movies, go look at how many games are coming out, how many indie studios mm. are starting up. There are a million jobs out there. And, and if you have like LinkedIn or something and you have all these at these uh, posts coming out talking about how many jobs are out there in the world, I just think that it's, it's the question becomes, how do you connect with that? Like, how do you make your connection to the thing that would most suit you the best? Um, mm. And that's our, that's our great struggle now is that it's so, um, there's so much out there that it's, that it becomes a little bit hard to um, find where your perfect job would be with when you have this influx of so much, so many opportunities. So back to the point at hand, it really bothers me when I hear people talking negatively about the broad thing because there is no broad thing there's your experience you had a good time or you had a bad time and just be honest about that and don't and, and it bothers me when people poison the well and tell students who have a fresh mind and they mm. they put their own negative thoughts into their mind which i think is unfair well said and 100 percent agree um and just to add to that as well i mean like obviously you mentioned the different like amount of work out there in different realms obviously like mentioned you know netflix amazon and the movies and the shows and the games um even the other realm as well like just being a content creator like even if you wanted to start something on like uh, the social media or youtube like there's people out there that are making you know like a, an amazing living at least if that's what you're looking for or even just like being able to expand the artwork in other realms even outside of your traditional um you know like industry you could say 
Um, so yeah, if there ever was, I mean, even a few years ago where people maybe were confused that, okay, is there a pathway? Now there's like, like you just mentioned, there's like hundreds now that you can definitely pursue. Um, but it's still important to make sure that you nurture your skill set, And that's what you'll be helping students do in your workshop, um, which I'm looking forward to. Um, firstly, are you excited about your workshop? Of course. Yeah. It's been a little while. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. It's been a little while since I've done one. And I think that the main, um, I think that the main thing that I, that I enjoy doing about this is just kind of sharing my journey and what, what got me here in the first place is, is sharing my journey with everybody and, and talking from, you know, I do a lot of thinking about, uh, about what, what we do in our profession and different ways to think about it. And so to me, it's not so much of, you know, I'm not the guy that's going to go and give you all the technical information in every corner of the of the program and every single like trick that no one else knows. I kind of feel I'm a little bit of a, you know, if you're if you're talking about boxing metaphors, I'm throwing jabs, crosses and hooks. I'm just throwing mm -hmm. like the ba I'm, I have the basics and I have um, a little bit of a creativity of using those those basics mm -hmm. in a way that I feel defines my my style and my um, my vision. So I like talking about and I, so. I feel the reason why that is relevant is because that's exactly what I think beginners and, and younger artists need. They need to understand that, that those basics, those things that you already know, that is all you need to know. And what's preventing you from achieving those higher levels of what you're trying to, um, what you're trying to reach, that's not, it's not a matter of like learning a new software. It's not what's going to get you to be the great artist that you think that you should be. Um, it's not, it's a matter of your thinking and th your creativity using those basics in a way that is, that is your true vision that you have in your head, that five years better in your head thing. Generally speaking, if you could unlock that and you could do what's in your head and you could just put it out there in an instant, in the snap of a finger, you would be very happy with what you'd be making probably, but none of us can do that. But the point is, is that you want to get as close to that as you can. And I think that it's a matter of mastering your thought process and your um your and, and, and uh, keeping it in the moment of the basics that you need to achieve that one thing that you're trying to do rather than getting uh overwhelmed by the the technical process. So I'm always trying to split the balance between explaining my using my journey of how I got to be where I am as a as a way to kind of maybe show students who might be confused or overwhelmed like, look, it's not as crazy as you think it is. Focus, think, just learn one new thing, one new skill, one new tool, program, whatever, and just focus on how you can get that next task done on the part that you think that you can possibly make in that new unfamiliar tool. And then the rest of it, do it the way that you are comfortable doing it. And you won't be as overwhelmed or crushed by the process. Mm. And we'll focus more on design, more on your ideas, because to be honest, you could go and watch a YouTube video on how to learn any Blender tool that there probably is, and you'll get a good, probably several different good explanations on how to use it. But I'm here to show you that I think that there's a lot more to it than that, that, that the foundation of, the des of design and creativity happens way earlier in the, that happens in the drawing on a napkin in a restaurant mm -hmm. phase that I think that's the thing that people may overlook the importance of. And I mean, if anybody is unsure, like just about, you know, like starting off in concept art and getting into the industry and what they should and shouldn't do. Firstly, just looking at a your body of work, which is sim simply phenomenal. Um, and even as a so as an artist, but even as an as an instructor. So like, um, I recently just what rewatched your sketching anything course, and what you've just mentioned then is like if you cut that course in half or any cross section at any point it's there throughout um it's you know like you mentioned it's about using the tools effectively getting your point across as an artist like it's it's all there and it's it's all super usable um to the point where it's like you know like you could even close your eyes listen to it and still figure out how to make art without just watching the demonstration um because your passion is passion is as such so in the workshop itself like what can students expect to like learn and get from you 
Well, th- thank you for that kind words. First of all, um, I, you know, I, I feel like they're all like that. Everything that I do is in that same vein of how do we break down this complex scene, which I chose something very, very complex. Like there are a lot of aspects to it. I know it, it reads as a simple thing when you look at it as a thumbnail, but when you kind of zoom in and look at the scene that I'm going to be breaking down, there are a lot of aspects to it that that took a lot of thinking and every single object, every little ship, every little every little aspect of the space station and all the, the larger sh- armada of ships and all that, everything took a lot of thought process and how it all feels cohesive together. And so I think what people will expect is, is a, is a similar approach the way sketching anything breaks down. Um, I, and by the way, that, that course was such a blast to do, uh, with learn squared and I, and I, it was a ton of work, but I feel that the, the feedback I've gotten from people, it does seem that, you know, it makes me feel really good that that many people have been able to, you know, up their design skills, um, and their their understanding of of just designing things in general, which is really what the course was meant to be. It happens to be sketching versus I don't know, like digital painting or mm. uh, you know m- sculpting things quickly in three D. But it really is about design, and that's that's pretty much that's pretty much what this is, except for something a lot more complicated. So you get to see a little bit of my process using three D coat, using Blender, using um, Octane. But it's more about, it's not about like literally how you do every single thing that I did. I will do some of that. I will show like the techniques that I use in sculpting to get the look that I did on the ships, like the simple process that the way I modeled those ships, the simple modeling and design that goes into the the larger kind of space station thing in the background. And then all the way back to like the, 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 oh, oh, cool moment, like the, the, moment of doing a little sketch uh, on a on a post-it note you know on your desk where you're just like oh yeah or while you're on the phone or whatever it is and you're like that's a shape that I want to I want to go deeper into that and where I get my inspiration from you know a lot of inspiration which is to me your research that's your that's your visual library that when you go back to your to your um to your instincts what comes out of your brain by default and that is only what you put in is what comes out so um, I'm talking about all that stuff and how to, how to bring it all together is a, a very complex image and how I got there with the, the basic processes that everybody knows that's going to be watching. And whoever's listening live as soon as this podcast drops, um, this will be released before the workshop goes live. So if you are interested, um, head on over to learnsquared.com and it kicks off at, I believe, oh, i got to switch to my LA time. It's, um, is it 10 a.m.? It's 10 a.m. onwards, right? On right here, October. yeah. It, it, yeah. it is now. Yeah. Um, I'll, it'll all be in the links. It'll all be in the description. Um, and you definitely want to sign up to this because also at the end of it, you'll get in a roughly an hour or so of QA with Aaron as well. Um, so you can, you know, put your burning questions to Aaron, um, as well as anything that he creates in the workshop. Also, um, do students need to prepare for anything, um, before they? jump into the workshop or is it something that they can just join and sit back and absorb all the goodness? No, I, I generally don't, I don't need anyone to, to prepare anything. Obviously for the people that, that do have any familiarity with, with any 3d programs, you will, it, it will be a little bit more, um, it will be a little bit more obvious what is going on when you see me do something that isn't always explicitly explained. Um, you'll see, you'll understand a little bit more of that. But if you don't understand, I think it'll still be useful because I'm not going into great technical detail about every single like how to of the programs. It's more like if you don't know it, then the process is what's more valuable than the how to connect nodes together. And if you do know it, then you'll probably be able to see what I'm doing anyway. So it's kind of, I want it to be more about design for the beginners and and the the process of breaking down something very complex. And for people intermediate or advanced, then you will see, oh, that's that's an interesting way of modeling, or that's that's how you blend those softwares together, and that's how it makes that result. You know, so th- it, it, I feel like it is applicable for both without any necessarily uh, preparation. Awesome, and I literally can't wait to see, obviously, the workshop itself, but also how people would take that and interpret that as well. Because if sketching anything is a, a benchmark for how students have taken your teachings and created their own awesomeness like this is just i'm excited to see that um 
I think that's a great note to end the podcast on also. Um, any final thoughts or words from yourself, Aaron? No, I'm really, really grateful for everybody's participation and, and throughout the years. And, um, and I'm really great. I'm, I'm excited to, to pour out some new stuff for you. I know it's been a little while since I've been posting regularly. So I felt like, yeah, I, I owed, I owed everybody a little bit of, a, a, a just a, you know, a upload of some thoughts, you know, and I'll have a lot to share and a lot, a lot of stuff to, uh, to bring back to the table, which I, I haven't done one of these since, um, since you know the sketching anything so this will be a different look at that and a different um a different dive into my my personal process that i think is a lot of fun awesome can't wait thanks aaron thank you so much a huge thanks to aaron for dropping all that wisdom if you're listening to this at the time this episode drops then there is still time to grab a seat for his live workshop which is on october the 9th if you're listening to this after october the 9th then you can still grab a pre-recorded version over at learnsquared.com. And remember, you can still learn the brilliant way Aaron designs and forms the basis of all his creations by taking his course, Sketching Anything. And better yet, the first lesson is free. All the links are in this episode's description. And remember, if you're enjoying the podcast, please like, subscribe, and tell your friends. Till next time.